Hello and welcome to the Ohio Arts Council's Rife Galleries Build It, Artists Creating Community in Ohio, Do-It-Yourself Creative Writing Workshop with Scott Woods. We're gonna hear from Scott Woods first, gather our materials and work through the project step-by-step. Step. You'll need to pause the video to read and work at your own pace. Enjoy. So welcome. My name is Scott Woods. I am a writer, a sometimes journalist, a poet, an artist, a curator of arts. And I'm going to uh, walk you through a workshop um, based on the Build It exhibit, right? So basically, um, I'm going to talk a lot and you're going to write a lot. That's how this is going to work. So uh, that may take the form of poetry for you or memoir or fiction or diary entries, whatever form you wanna write in right now is perfectly okay. Um, this isn't any particular form-based workshop. This is more about getting you to engage art and then find a way to transpose that or work that into or marry that or in any other way that you express yourself, find a way to combine what you are observing, how it makes you feel, what it makes you think about, and turn that into something creative. That is what we are doing. So as we begin the workshop today, um, I want you to go ahead and get whatever it is that you use to create. Um, if that's a journal that you write in long form, uh, if that's a laptop, if that's a sketchbook, if we're doing uh, some kind of writing or something else. Um, if that's loose paper, uh, whatever way you write is the right answer. All right. So just make sure that as we go through here, you leave yourself some room to kind of maybe go back to the work, reference the work, um, that kind of thing. So now we're going to get to talking about what we're going to do in terms of the actual work today. And as we go into looking at art and thinking about writing or maybe turning off our brains and not thinking about what we're writing, I want to talk about just get a little piece of advice as we go into this um, about what it's about versus what it's really about. So we're engaging artwork, right? We're looking at it. Um, you're thinking about it. Uh, you're writing in response to it. You're possibly even having a conversation with it. Um, and so, but you're also creating at the same time, right? You're creating something new, something that did not exist before. And so as such, you should consider how nothing that you're looking at actually looks like the things that they're about, right? None of the art is real in terms of whatever the subject is. It may have a house, but it, it's not a real house, right? Um, so you, you get to infer what you think the art means and what it doesn't. And that, that will also apply to what you write. Um, so let's try to get into some work here. So this uh, first prompt here is based on a piece um, by Anissa Lewis, it's entitled Strong Signs 1 and 2. Now, if you were in the gallery, if you walked into the gallery, the first thing you would see are these clapboards uh, that Lewis put together and that people who were visiting the gallery were able to write on in response. Um, and so what's interesting here is how inquisitive the work is, right? Like you know, my neighborhood is strong wind, I feel strong wind, that kind of thing. It's, it's asking you to interrogate yourself, right? The art is doing that. Uh, where it's placed also is kind of important, right? It's the first thing you see when you come in. And so it kind of throws this patina, this color, this over the whole experience of the gallery. It's asking you to use your brain as you walk through. And then also it's very tactile. You're, you are given the opportunity to actually write on the clapboards, right? So now 
our first exercise is for you to actually do that where you are now. Answer the question, I feel strong when whatever. So this next prompt is also a piece, again, by Anissa Lewis. Uh, this one's 1313 Gerard Street. And on this one, again, this is kind of what I referenced earlier, where a house is not a house, right? Um, and so in response to this piece, what I would like you to do is to record three words that come to mind when you see this piece. Um, and then once you've done that, I want you to compose a piece, poem, lyric, paragraph, random thought, whatever, that utilizes at least two of those words, right? So you're recording three words that occur to you. You're gonna use two of them in a piece now. We really kind of need to talk about the times that we're in right? Uh, 2020 was a really powerful year in a lot of ways. Um, most of them seemingly negative, but, you know, ultimately probably a lot of community and national growing pains, right? As we begin to reckon with who and what we are as cities, as a country, as people, right, as communities. And so 2020, because of that, was this huge year for community-based art. The pandemic was raging. Uh, there was the George Floyd, Breonna Taylor protest things that were happening all like, you know, from the spring on. And um, the year was basically just charged with this political and social upheaval. The demonstrations and the protests that were happening during the spring and summer uh, compounded these feelings that everyone everywhere had about spending their first few months in lockdown. And two years later, now we're still kind of in the mix of that, right? Like how much has really changed since then? You know, not as much as as we as any of us would like. And some of the things that have changed have not necessarily changed in the way that we want. And somewhere in there, and somewhere in all of that, public art became a really huge thing. Um, now in Columbus, that took on some interesting angles, right? A uh, question from the year before that would have been like, well, where's all the public art? And then in 2020, <laughs> that question changed, right? It became a much harder question. It was like, well, how do we address this moment through public art? And what messages or changes are you trying to share and implement through this public art? Um, even, uh, you know, a quote that I wrote many years before in an essay about racism just popped back up and went viral all over again, right? It became a piece of public art in New York. And so, Lots of organizations and businesses stepped up, they stepped in, they stepped away from the questions that public art presents. And in Columbus, you know, the most notable and visible engagement occurred downtown, uh, where buildings which had been boarded up were painted as part of a campaign, um, largely curated by the Greater Columbus Arts Council. But what's interesting in these moments is that they're constantly changing. The moment itself is constantly changing, but we only address them as a community at large, a fraction at a time. Um, and so you really have to kind of, you know, thinking about how the world deals with it is almost too big. Just focus on your city, right? Your corner of the thing. Um, imagine a city in which we applied that level of energy and resource each time a, such a moment called for it, right? Like if we, if we were constantly prepared to rise to the occasion with art, with creativity, whenever these moments arise, right? Um, 
And there's a lot of, you know, tough questions and tough conversations in that art, at which, it, which it should be, right? Um, not just why did it take this moment to make that happen, but why is this work only happening, you know, where let's say in Columbus's case, for the most part, where white industries exist. So for instance, the public art did not explode in black neighborhoods. The public art did not explode in Somali neighborhoods. Um, it didn't explode in Asian neighborhoods. And so why aren't we creating this public art in neighborhoods that are directly affected by these issues? I don't wanna put words in anybody's mouth, but that's something we have to think about, right? Doesn't Lyndon deserve public art? What, wasn't that part of how the short North changed from the inner city to an arts district? So anyhow, um, I don't wanna to get too deep into it, but I do wanna kind of put that in your mind as we move forward. Um, just kind of think about, imagine the work done in a way that doesn't line up with the community that it sits in. Or if it does, what does that say about how the community is changing? So I wanna move into a prompt now, right? This will be um, related to, this is a piece um, by Cal Calcogno Cullen out of Cincinnati, if I got that right. Um, and in this prompt, as you'll see, there are two typewriters facing one another and they are sharing a scroll of paper. And there's a lot that, that you could read into that, right? But what I want you to do, and here's your prompt, I want you to write a letter to yourself in the past about the changes that will come to the places where you grew up right? Now we're really digging into this idea of not just what community means in this conceptual sense, but what is a neighborhood in a very real and concrete sense? Will the mall still be there? You know, what happened to that, to that guy who used to run everyone off of his immaculate lawn, right? In my neighborhood, uh, that was Mr. Miller, <laughs> right? Um, what happened to the lawn? Do the places where you grew up still exist? Are the buildings gone or just the contents? How does nostalgia inherent in the phrase, you can never go home again, apply to where you come from? What is where you come from? When you think about where you come from, is that a house? Is that a, is that a town? Is that a street? Is that a family unit? What is it, right? Is it a school? So um, I want you to take some time to think about that before you launch into this particular exercise. But I want you to write a letter to yourself in the past about the changes that will come to the places where you grew up. You are in the future. You are who you are. You are writing the letter to an older, not an older, to a an old, younger version of yourself. And you are informing them, hey, this is what's coming, right? Just a letter, write a letter. And then once you finish the letter, I want you to take the message of that letter, whatever it is, and turn that into a haiku. Mm. That's tough. And for those of you who may not remember from school what a haiku is, it's just a three line poem, 17 syllables total. The first line has five syllables. The second line has seven syllables. The third line has another five syllables, total 17 syllables, right? This fourth prompt is, I'm not gonna lie to you, you're gonna to have to put your thinking caps on for this one. So this is a piece by Dana Lynn Harper. It's entitled Field Guides, right? And so I've seen a lot of Dana's work, but this piece really captures their style in a very different way than the traditional kind of ceiling hanging variations that I know. 
uh, these pieces have been uh, personified, not as humans, but as some kind of being, right? These are supposed to be not people, but entities, right? And so I want you to look at the picture of this piece. And I want you to pick one of these tour guides. Could be the blue one, could be the orange one, could be one of the purple ones, the pink one, whatever. And they're all different. It's obviously not just color. There's shape and there's height differentials. Some of them seem to just be hovering above the ground. Some of them seem to be flying. That's up to you. Pick your tour guide. Now, I want you to start, this is more um, kind of a list of things, right? I want you to answer some questions. Where are they taking you? What are they showing you, right? Are the things that they're showing you familiar or are they completely new to you as an experience? Are they showing you something that a traditional tour guide might, you know, well, here is this location, here is where this happened, here is such and such is home, blah, blah, blah. Or are they letting you figure things out, right? Kind of like um, how a museum docent might be. Well, what do you see in this piece, right? What makes, what, what do you feel when you look at this? Is that the kind of guide that they are, right? Or if you want to get classical about it, are you the pilgrim led by Virgil through the inferno, right? Or is this more like a double-decker bus in London, right? I'm gonna let you decide. You kind of figure out what that guide is trying to show you. As you're doing this, um, I, I want you to, and this is, this is something that even experienced writers forget to do, and it, it, it's, it enhances whatever we create so much but it's so simple. I want you to use all of your senses. What does a being like this, an entity like this, what does it smell like? Does it have a texture, right? Do any of those things that you take in through those senses, do they remind you of any particular taste? Like these things all kind of round out the descriptive experience, right? which makes writing so, if you do it right, it, it can make your writing or, or anything you create more robust, right? So use all your senses, all of them. Once you've kind of done that, answered that question, where are they taking you? What are they showing you? I want you to rewrite the piece that you created, right? whether that was a poem or just a list or anything, I want you to rewrite that information, that content into another form. So if you wrote all of that down as a poem, now I want you to write it down as a piece of fiction or prose, or whatever. If you wrote it as a diary entry, now I want you to write it as a song lyric. You know, I just want you to decide whatever those forms are. You know what you wrote, but, and I don't, but, you should pick something new now, something different, and try to capture all of that information again, but different. Uh, this, this was my favorite piece out of the whole exhibit, if I'm completely honest. I loved it so much and it spoke to me so much that I bought it. <laughs> so, um, as you can see, um, this is a painting. Um, it's a, what we would call a very representative piece, right? It's pretty straightforward, right? It's a drawer full of objects. It's entitled Inheritance. Um, most of the things in the drawer are utilized in artistic practices. Pencils, chalk, ink stamp, erasers, that kind of thing. Uh, but there's some other goodies in there too that I won't describe for you. You should try to experience them for yourself. You can probably make them out. But the title, the title really gives this thing its edge, right? Inheritance, which brings us to our exercise. I want you to write down, again, as poem, lyric, journal entry, paragraph, whatever. 
think about what's been left behind. By whom, to whom. Is there one story here or are there 12 stories here, right? What does it mean that there are non-art supplies mixed in with all of these art supplies, right? Are those things really not artistic? Maybe they have some artistic purpose, I don't know. Maybe the art supplies have no artistic purpose. We don't know the story here, right? So I want you to kind of think about like, and, and write down like, what's been left behind by whom, you know, and to whom, right? Um, and write that as, like I said, again, as a poem or lyric or paragraph or what have you. And just kind of think about that story for a moment. Once you've got that down, I want you to now, this is a separate piece, to pick one piece out of the drawer and write about it exclusively. So now you're writing something else, right? You're writing another poem, paragraph, whatever, um, but, but only about one thing out of the drawer. And you can now apply, if you wish, some of that history that you created, some of those answers to the questions that you already, you know, by whom, to whom, you can apply that now in this second piece to that one object. So you're kind of, this is a twofer, right? You're getting two things out of one drawer, right? The meta and the specific. This next prompt, and it is our last prompt, is based on a piece by Stephanie Rond called The Rising Sun. Now, this piece has a lot going on, right? There's, there's this little tease of history, right? Like anytime you see like a boarded up structure, you're like, that's got history. Um, but this one so clearly has history. And this whole ghost-like presentation of it, right? This really pale blue, ethereal like juxtaposition of the past with the present you know floating objects that are somehow very specific but really general like what is their purpose you don't know some of them appear to be inside of the structure some of them appear to be outside of the structure and then there is this being this person outside not counting the cat so there's technically two beings, right? Um, outside of the house, uh, doing something, right? And please note the title here, right? The rising sun is not spelled like the celestial body. It is spelled like the child, sun, S-O-N, right? So the after you've taken all of that in, all of the details and, and kind of how all of that is hitting you, um, here, um, I want you to go wild on this prompt, right? Again, it could be poem, it could be paragraph, essay, it could be whatever. And take your time with this one because there's a lot here. Um, and think about what does the title mean in relation to what you're looking at? What is the rising sun? right? What is the sun? The bulb is kind of, you see a light bulb kind of hanging in the air there. Is that the sun? Well, what about the sun that's lighting the house that we can't see? A lot going on here. A lot going on here. How do these parts connect? Do they connect? Are they even really connecting? Right? Half the time when you talk to an artist and you say, well, what does this aspect of the piece mean? And they're just like, I don't know. I just like eggs, right? Or whatever. So don't try to unlock this through the artist. Try to unlock this through yourself. You are creating the story here. You are adding senses to this. You are adding history to this. And so this one should be totally free form. And this one... You know, think about the things that you've already kind of done, right? Um, in the other pre in the previous exercises, and how that all kind of sinks into this big one, right? 
This is the last one, the big one, right? So if you've enjoyed yourself in our time together, you can find more of the things that I do as a writer um, at my website, scottwoodswrites.net. Um, that's a blog. Um, but also, um, I'm very active on all the social medias, on Twitter, uh, on Instagram, on Facebook. I use them very differently too, right? So um, being on one will not always get you the content of the others. So I'm very savvy like that. Also, um, you're looking at this really big picture of a really beautiful building on the east side. That's Streetlight Guild. That is a building that I run. Um, it's a cultural arts organization. And when there's not a pandemic raging, we're doing events and art exhibits and all manner of things in that space. So you can check out um, what we've done and what we will do at the website streetlightguild.org. And so that concludes uh, pretty much this workshop. I hope that you had fun. I think creation should always have some element of joy, regardless of its subject. And I hope that you've had something to think about in terms of, you know, how can we be better, not just artists, but citizens? How can we be more mindful of the history behind the things that we're looking at and the things that we are, right? Um, thank you so much. Thank you again for joining us for the Build It Artist Creating Community in Ohio Creative Writing Do-It-Yourself Workshop with Scott Woods. I'd like to give a special thank you to Scott Woods for leading this workshop, as well as to Erica Hess, the curator of the exhibition, to the governor's office, the Ohio legislature, and the Ohio Arts Council's board who support this great space.